Who could South Carolina's breakout candidates be for the 2022 football season? We'll be discussing that today on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, as always, Andrew Lyon, and well, in today's show, I'm going to look at four different football players for South Carolina that I think could break out for the 2022 football season. I'm going to give some relevant stats for all four of these guys and also give some reasoning as to why I think they could break out based on just some of my observations that I have seen with each individual player over the last couple of seasons or so. We'll be going over all that today on the show, but before I do so, thank you as always for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your daily choice for South Carolina sports coverage. All right, so the first two players that I'm going to be going over in the show today are players that I think are probably the most likely out of my four selections to break out. And I'm going to start off with one that admittedly would probably be an obvious pick for a lot of the South Carolina fan base, but it's just one that I cannot stay away from, and that is running back Marshawn Lloyd. Now, Marshawn Lloyd, of course, as you may recall, was a five-star recruit in the 2020 recruiting class for the Gamecocks and finished ranked as the 33rd best player in the country, according to rivals. Now, Marshawn Lloyd came to South Carolina and took over the running back one spot and was poised to be the starting running back for South Carolina's offense in week one of the 2020 season until he had a horrible non-contact incident in fall camp where he tore his left ACL and it would end up being a whole eight, nine, ten months before he was completely cleared to return to all football activities. Now, In 2021, Marshawn Lloyd would share carries with guys like Kevin Harris, Saquandre White, and Juju McDowell. Kevin Harris and Saquandre White, obviously both very talented running backs in their own right, who are now both taking their best shot at the NFL. And Juju McDowell, probably one of the fastest players on South Carolina's football team. In 12 games in 2021, Marshawn Lloyd had 64 carries, for 228 rushing yards and one rushing touchdown, averaging 3.6 yards per carry. And it just never really looked like Marshawn Lloyd was 100% during the 2021 season. And the reason why I think this was the case, and this is one of the few things that I will ever be able to relate to compared to these guys who obviously are playing at the highest level in college football, but When you have a major injury in one of your joints, say, of course, like your knee, maybe your wrist or your shoulder or your hip, whenever you have a serious injury like a torn ACL, quite frankly, the seven to nine months that takes to just physically recover from the injury doesn't do the mental aspect of the recovery process enough justice. And I can tell you all, back when I was playing high school football, I was somebody that, you know, I wasn't a very good player. I'll I'll just be completely upfront and honest about that. But in the offseason between my sophomore and junior year, I tore my right patellar tendon or the tendon that connects to my kneecap in my right knee joint. And while it took me five months overall from the time I injured or tore my right patella tendon to actually get completely cleared physically to return to all of our strength conditioning activities and be ready for fall camp and everything, my entire junior season, I still never fully gained back trust in my right knee. 
I always had the worry in the back of my mind that just one really bad slip up, one miss, one misstep, and I could end up tearing it again. And just like that, I would be back in the training room. And it just takes such a toll on you mentally as an athlete when you have an injury like that happen. And I think that's what happened with Marshawn Lloyd last season. I think that's part of the reason why maybe you saw Marshawn play a little bit more hesitant whenever he was out there and he did get carries because he just didn't seem like that he was really that willing to make a really big cut and try to, you know, do a bunch of agile jukes and jives against opposing defenders. It just never seemed like he trusted the knee enough to be able to do those kind of things until the Florida game. It was the first game, I think, that he actually was not playing with the knee brace on. And you could tell in the Florida game, if you watch the game closely, that Marshawn Lloyd just felt so much more comfortable. And it seemed like that he had gotten a little bit of a spurt back into his running style. Now, to fast forward to this past spring game, this April, Lloyd had 42 rushing yards on eight carries for an average of five yards per carry and looked like he was back to his old self before the ACL tear. And Shane Beamer, of course, talked about that in the press conference after the spring game, saying that, kind of like I just mentioned, he never felt like Marshawn was 100% this past season, and he felt like that the spring game was very indicative of the fact that Marshawn was officially back, and he was itching and ready to get back on the field and show fans what he could do, why he was rated a five-star coming out of high school, and why there was so much hype when he got to Columbia. Now, overall, why do I believe that Marshawn Lloyd will break out this season? Now, there's a couple reasons why. First of all, just purely based off of the elimination of a couple guys that were on the depth chart from last season. Again, Kevin Harris and Zaquandre White both are off to the NFL, and both of those guys were considered to be ahead of Marshawn Lloyd, as far as I'm concerned, on the depth chart in regards to last season. And with those guys being gone, Christian Bill Smith being a transferring back from Wake Forest coming into the program, and Juju McDowell, while... He brings a lot of juice to the running back room and has certain things that he brings to the table that the other running backs don't bring. I think that Marshawn Lloyd, with the time he's had in the program and his overall skill set, is the best suited to take advantage of the running back one spot being left open as of right now. As I've mentioned, I think he's fully back from the knee injury. I think mentally and physically, Marshawn Lloyd is probably the best he has felt since, again, before he tore that ACL back in fall camp in 2020. And also, I think that there's a lot more playmaking ability on the offensive side of the ball. You look at last year's offense, and while, of course, you can ask some questions about the offensive coordinator, maybe some of the play calling and strategizing that took place, going into each game, and certain games in particular, there's no doubt that this offense last year was just lacking in playmakers. Josh Van, of course, really took charge in the wide receiver group and became a really solid option and target for whoever was quarterbacking South Carolina throughout the entirety of last season. The running back room, while stacked to the gills with talent, could not get enough going just because the offensive line, quite frankly, just didn't do the job when it came to run blocking for the first three quarters of the season. And, of course, as I've mentioned before, the revolving door quarterback and the guys that even did play there, for one reason or another, they just were not playing, you know, I don't want to say winning football, but it wasn't unlocking what the offense could potentially be that Marcus Satterfield wants with his pro-style scheme. Spencer Rattler obviously changes that to a great deal. So I think that when you combine all of these factors, I think that Marshawn Lloyd has a great chance to break out for South Carolina in the 2022 football season. Now, coming up in just a few moments, I will discuss the second most likely breakout candidate, in my opinion, for South Carolina in the 2022 football season. But before I do that, I have a quick word from my friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports information where you'll find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds. And this includes this year's NHL Stanley Cup Finals. 
As of this recording, the Avalanche are up 2-0 on the Lightning. Lightning desperately need a win to get back into this series. And they won't have any chance to potentially pull off the historic three-peat that they are aiming for. You've also got regular season Major League Baseball going on right now. I've talked about the National League East a lot. What about the New York Yankees? Yankees are 49-17 and as of this recording. And they could break 100 or... Who knows? Maybe even 110 wins during the regular season. Question is, though, based on the future bets, do y'all think that's going to be the case? And, of course, there's also all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC all the way to boxing. Bet Online acts as a continuous source for all of your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and much, much more. So head on over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay, so the second most likely breakout candidate for the South Carolina Gamecocks this upcoming season is, again, probably somebody that multiple fans will maybe think about when you hear his name. But again, it's just somebody that I just can't stay away from, and that is defensive end Jordan Birch. Now, Jordan Birch, just like Marshawn Lloyd, was also rated a five-star recruit and the 17th best player in the 2020 recruiting class, according to rivals. He showed flashes during his freshman campaign, but he was marred by some nagging injuries, and of course, the fact that it was the COVID-shortened season. In his freshman campaign, however, Jordan Birch would still rack up 19 tackles, 2.5 tackles for loss, and one fumble recovery in 8 game appearances. In his sophomore season, Birch would once again be a backup behind fifth-year senior Aaron Sterling. He would still, however, play in all 13 games, recording 26 total tackles, including two and a half tackles for loss, and a pick six against Eastern Illinois in week one of the season where he really got to showcase just how good of an athlete he is for a man that plays the defensive end position at his size. Now, in the spring game this year, Jordan Birch was flying around and doing a great job of setting the edge on the weak side of the offensive formation and, in my opinion, was one of the best players on the night on defense in terms of recognizing what plays were being run very quickly. And just to let y'all know how good I thought Jordan Birch did in that game, I had him at a final grade of plus six in the spring game when comparing the amount of positive plays he had to the amount of negative plays he had. Now, why do I believe Jordan Birch will break out this season? Well, kind of like Marshawn Lloyd in one sense, I think he's going to benefit from finally getting a long-awaited chance to be a starting defensive end in the Gamecock defense. He has had to, of course, wait his turn. He's had multiple really solid, experienced veterans that have been in front of him since he has been here at South Carolina. And with Aaron Sterling and Kingsley Navari both now gone, he and Jordan Strawn on the opposite side are going to get their chance to show the SEC and college football what they can do being the primary guys on an SEC defense. I think that Jordan Birch has all of the athletic tools that you could possibly want in a defensive end. He's a guy that is extremely explosive. He has fantastic straight line speed, and he, he has been known as a great athlete since his time at the Hammond School in Columbia, South Carolina, where he played high school ball at. He has always been a man amongst boys. And yes, maybe you could say that him now playing SEC football compared to the football he's playing in high school caught up to him a little bit at first. But there's no doubt when you watch Jordan Birch on film and during games, Jordan Birch is more often than not the best athlete in his one-on-one -on -one matchup, regardless of who he is facing. Another thing to keep in mind with Jordan Birch, this will be his second year in Clayton White's defensive scheme, which means that this is the first time in Jordan Birch's three-year career that he is not learning a new scheme. You have to remember, he was a part of Traverius Robinson's defense back in 2020, who, of course, was also being directed by head coach Will Muschamp, who was a no-defensive guru. And then this past season, of course, was Jordan Birch's first year in Clayton White's new defensive scheme. Now he has had a year to get used to the scheme, to understand what it is that Clayton White looks for his defensive lineman to do, what his responsibilities are, et cetera, et cetera. So 
I think that that's going to greatly benefit Jordan Birch this next season. And he'll also benefit from being in the weak side defensive end spot more often than the strong side spot, which means he's probably going to go up against tackles that are not going to be the best in pass protection. Now, as I mentioned before, in Clayton White's scheme, he has a quote-unquote edge position two defensive tackles positions, and then a regular defensive end position. The edge position, the big difference there basically is this. The edge position is the spot where he has a defensive end stand up in a two-point stance, which basically, like I just said, literally means they're just standing straight up. They don't have a hand in the turf when they're getting ready to potentially try to jump the snap from the offense. And for Clayton White's scheme, that is where he will typically put his best pass rusher now is that meant to be an indictment against Jordan Birch and his pass rushing ability no not at all it's just the fact that Jordan Strawton who is expected to start in that spot this next season is a guy that two years ago I think led the FBS in total sacks with 10 and a half at Georgia State so Jordan Strawn's a guy that, you know, he's such a good pass rusher. You don't want to have him, you know, away from the strong side of the play, especially if you think that it's going to be a passing play. And because of that, right tackles, typically in schemes where you have right-handed quarterbacks, since they're not responsible for protecting the blind side of the quarterback, those right tackles are typically not going to be the most dominant pass protectors. And with everything I just mentioned earlier, Scheme knowledge now being even better than it was last year. All the athletic tools that Jordan Birch brings to the table. And obviously, somebody who I think is going to have a big chip on his shoulder in regards to finally getting a chance to show fans what he can do and why he was rated a five-star coming out of high school. I think Jordan Birch is prime for a really solid year in 2022. All right. Now, for these final two breakout candidates. These guys, in my opinion, might not have as good of a chance as the other two I've mentioned up to this point. However, I could still see a way in which both of these guys end up fitting the bill here. And for the second to last guy, I'm going to talk about wide receiver Xavier Leggett. Now, Xavier Leggett is a wide receiver who has been here since 2019. He never redshirted. And as a freshman in 2019, he showed a lot of promise late in the season. He finished the year with nine receptions, 80 receiving yards, and one receiving touchdown in 11 total games played. But over the next two seasons, however, both due to being surpassed on the depth chart and having certain events occur that were out of his control off the field, like the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, and a motor vehicle accident last year, which dinged him up, took him away from practice and time away from being able to learn the new offensive scheme under new offensive coordinator Marcus Satterfield, along with a couple of nagging injuries that he's also had to deal with in his time, like Jordan Birch, it has sort of held like it back from being able to reach his full potential, as he's only gotten 15 receptions for 176 receiving yards and one receiving touchdown, both in the 2020 and 21 seasons combined. Now, this past spring, it appears as if the light has finally started to come on for wide receiver Xavier Leggett. As many offensive players, wide receiver coach Justin Stepp, and even head coach Shane Beamer sang the praises of Xavier as someone who had worked really hard to get better, both in the weight room with winter strength conditioning and on the field as a wide receiver running routes and going through 7-on-7 seven seven and team drills in practice. In the spring game this past April, Leggett had two receptions for 34 receiving yards, including a 30-yard crossing route reception that he got from Spencer Rattler, and he had a final grade of plus three from me from his spring game performance. Now, why do I believe that Xavier Leggett could be a breakout player in 2022? Well, this is the first time in four years that Xavier Leggett is not learning a new offensive scheme. If you think about it, again, 2019, offensive coordinator was Brian McClendon. 2020, his offensive coordinator was Mike Bobo. 2021, offensive coordinator was Marcus Satterfield. This year, Marcus Satterfield is still the offensive coordinator. And finally, Xavier Leggett is not having to learn a whole bunch of new sets, a whole bunch of new plays, a lot of new terminology. It's the same exact deal, in my opinion, as Jordan Birch, except for, quite frankly, an even worse circumstance in this case. 
He also has years of experience in the program. And no matter what you say about maybe having experience that's coming back that is not productive versus very productive, in my opinion, it always helps to have guys who are coming back that understand the program, that have been around the block a couple of times in college football, no matter who that may be. And the other thing for Xavier Leggett that's working in his favor is, quite frankly, right now, there is no set wide receiver number three on the depth chart for the offense at this point. You know that wide receivers one and two are going to be Josh Van and Antoine Wells Jr. I think all of Gamecock Nation can agree on that. However, the big question is, who's going to step in behind those two guys when we say have a three wide receiver set? And I know that some people might literally sit here and say, well, obviously, that's going to be Jaheim Bell. Okay, and I understand that because Jaheim Bell is quite literally a fantastic athlete and somebody who has a chance to earn all SEC and who knows if he has a really good season, maybe even all American honors. He's that good of a player. But Jaheim Bell can't go out there as the third wide receiver every single time. They're going to need to have somebody who specializes at the wide receiver position to be that third man. But who's it going to be? There's Dakaron Joyner, who's been in the program for four or five years now. There's Amarian Brown, who will have his second year in the program and under Marcus Satterfield's scheme. Somebody that maybe wasn't utilized as well last year, but maybe now this year, they'll know how to utilize him better. You've also got Corey Rucker, the Arkansas State transfer, a guy that brings a lot of experience, has been extremely productive in his time with the Red Wolves, and somebody who could easily slide into that slot position. Heck, even incoming freshman Landon Sampson could come in here and potentially take that third and final wide receiver spot. There's so many guys that could go in and step in and take that spot that is going to be really fun to watch and pay attention to fall camp this upcoming August to see which one of these wide receivers is going to step up and take that role. If Xavier Leggett has done as well as the coaches and players said he's done since this past spring practice period, then I think that this could potentially be Xavier's spot to lose. But of course, as always, we'll have to wait and see what happens when we reach that point. And the last player that I think could be a breakout candidate for this team in 2022, and this one is probably the boldest pick, at least for me in this video, is defensive tackle T.J. Sanders out of Marion, South Carolina. Now, T.J. Sanders, as you can see on the screen, was a 5.6 or mid-level three-star and the seventh best player of the state of South Carolina for the 2021 recruiting class, according to rivals. And he was also offered by teams like Tennessee, NC State, Virginia Tech, Wake Forest, West Virginia, Vanderbilt, and a couple of others. So T.J. Sanders wasn't just some diving in the rough find in the state of South Carolina. There were some other high-level college football programs, whether it's the conference they play or the history that they have, that really wanted this guy. And South Carolina was still able to keep him in state. So Sanders redshirted last year as he only played in two games, which were Eastern Illinois and North Carolina, and was only credited with one quarterback hurry between both games. He was on the scout team all season last year, and was deemed by players and coaches alike to be the toughest matchup for the starting offensive lineman in practice. With guys on the interior like center Eric Douglas giving the young freshman high praise a couple times over. Coach Beamer also took note this past fall. And he made sure to tell coaches on multiple occasions that they need to be watching him when they're going back and reviewing the film from practice. And that he's somebody that is going to really help us in the future. Now, why do I think... T.J. Sanders could break out this next season. Well, I think, again, most Gamecock fans would agree, Zach Pickens and Alex Boogie Huntley are going to be the two projected starting defensive tackles for Clayton White's defense this coming fall. Now, there is some room on the second string, however, for certain guys to step in. And the candidates for that are as follows. Fifth-year senior Rick Sandage, who had a broken leg injury that he has been dealing with since this past fall season, did not participate at all in spring practice. And at this point, it's just really a big question mark, in my opinion, as to, you know, how how much rust has Rick Sandage built up? Obviously, he's had to take time away because of this injury. How much strength has he gained back? 
How much is he going to really feel comfortable in this defense? That's a big question mark in in terms of looking at Rick Sanich for a second-string defensive tackle spot. You've also got junior Tonka Hemingway, who kind of is an older version of T.J. Sanders, someone who came in and immediately impressed coaches for his freshman year and actually earned a lot of meaningful snaps in 2020 and 2021. Is a guy that's a really good athlete. He's lying on his feet and was a multi-sport athlete back in high school. And, of course, you've also got six-year senior MJ Webb, who has made plenty of plays as a backup over his career, but he's mainly been a rotational player. Could he step in and be one of those backup defensive tackles this coming fall? So there is a lot of guys there vying for those two spots. However, in my opinion, TJ Sanders, depending on how he does this summer in the strength conditioning program and this upcoming fall camp, could very well take one of those spots. And he's got great athletic tools as well. He was both a star on the gridiron and on the hardwood in high school for Marion, earning Region 6 3A Player of the Year honors in basketball as a senior. So while TJ Sanders might not be as developed from a technique standpoint compared to some of these other guys at the defensive tackle spot, he more than has the athletic tools to be able to go out there and provide a lot of significant snaps for this defense. And again, it's not like we're asking TJ Sanders to potentially go out there and be a starter and have to play like 60 plus snaps a game. We're just expecting him to potentially go out there if say he's a second string defensive tackle. Go out there, you know, be sh- you know, be sure that you can give the guys a breather when they need it if say there is a long sustained drive by the opponent and provide us, you know, anywhere from I don't know, 18 to 30 snaps a game. So I think that TJ Sanders could definitely do that. And in my opinion, while he might not have the stats to show that, like some of these other guys that I've listed on today's show, I think that TJ Sanders can definitely make an impact and potentially break out for the Gamecocks if the cards fall a certain way in the 2022 season. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope that you all thoroughly enjoyed it. And as always, remember, if you want future notifications and alerts on when I have YouTube videos posted, be sure to subscribe down below and click the bell so that you will get alerts in the future. Normally post them in the morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Monday through Friday. And... Of course, the audio podcasts also come out as well, even earlier than that, Monday through Friday, wherever you may listen to your podcast daily. But again, thank you all so much for listening to today's show. Hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I will catch you all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks Podcast. <laughs>